Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to our event, uh, The Politics of Prisons, Women's Critiques and Alternatives. Uh, my name is Dilar Dirik, and I'm a member of GINI, Kurdish Women's Office for Peace. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be hosting this event uh, with an amazing lineup of speakers from different parts of the world, uh, whom I will introduce in a minute. Um, can I first ask all of the participants to please mute their uh, microphones? Um, thank you very much. We're currently live streaming on YouTube. And uh, this is a very important and exciting event because, of course, we are in the middle of the COVID-19 um, pandemic and many people have increasingly become more aware of the injustices and inequalities that shape our lives and that deny groups of people a uh, very right to live. And with the brutal murder of George Floyd by a white police officer in the United States, protests have been taking uh, over the streets in many parts of the world um, against anti-Black racism, uh, but also more generally against police brutality, against colonialism, criminalization of social movements and against fascism. Uh, people are aware that many of the things that brutalize our lives uh, and us um, are in fact connected to each other and that it's time for us also to unite our struggles and social movements. Uh, so in that internationalist spirit, we salute all the courageous peoples across the world, uh, especially women, that say no to the existing system and believe that another world is possible. Uh, so when we say Jin Jian Azadi in Kurdish, uh, we can't say that without saying Black Lives Matter. Or when women uh, say luchar, crear, poder popular uh, in different parts of Latin America and ni una menos, uh, women in Palestine respond with talat. Uh, we also call, join the calls of Filipina women who sing abante, babae, palaban, militante. Uh, these are some of the slogans from the movements that our speakers are part of. Are parts of, and uh, we are here today to speak about, to learn about the situation of political prisoners and prison systems, the political nature of prisons uh, from different parts of the world. So this panel is not just a platform to discuss the problems that we face, uh, we also want to discuss um, alternative ways of seeking justice and peace in our communities. And one reason why especially women of color and especially black feminists are at the forefront of discussions critiquing the inherently oppressive character of uh, the prison industrial complex, that's because they have moral and political objections to the fact that the patriarchal state based on supremacist ideas of racism and nationalism makes us think that the only way of establishing order is through surveillance, violence, authoritarianism and control. Uh, so we all object, that's why we're here today, because we refuse to accept, uh, just as we refuse to accept patriarchal violence as fate, we also do believe that another better society is possible and that the women's struggle as one of the biggest and transnational social movements of our time uh, will lead this path. So we want to reflect together also on how we can unite our struggles. So introduce uh, our office, Jenny, uh, the Kurdish Women's Office uh, for Peace. Uh, this is a representative office of the Kurdish women's uh, movement and one of, the, uh, one of its efforts to build connections with freedom-loving women around the world. It's part of the Women Weaving the Future um, network, which is a network of different institutions and structures of the Kurdish women's movement that was formed primarily uh, with the aim of building bridges with different feminist movements, women's struggles around the world, and to introduce our perspectives of building from below a world women's democratic confederalism, which is a perspective that we want to share with women around the world. Um, and in 2018, the network organized a conference that was attended by 500 women from different parts of the world, where we discussed questions like capitalism, poverty, ecocide, colonialism, and patriarchal violence. Um, this event is part of the Solidarity Keeps Us Alive campaign, which is a recently launched campaign, a, a joint campaign between different parts of the Kurdish women's movement and many other women's struggles in the world. Um, it was launched in the context of COVID-19, especially when we saw that political prisoners, but generally prisoners around the world, were among those who's, who were seen by their respective states as disposable. Um, you may know that there are currently tens of thousands of uh, political prisoners, mainly Kurdish people, in Turkish jails, uh, thousands of whom are women. 
among them activists, uh, human rights defenders, elected politicians, writers, workers, artists. So, um, and the Turkish state excluded the political prisoners from the COVID-19 amnesty. Um, so we came together with a group of different women's movements in different parts of the world to join, jointly launch this campaign. And of course, while it started in the context of the pandemic, uh, prisons should always be our priority in our struggle. So we hope that this can be a campaign beyond the pandemic. Um, also, when it comes to the question of prisons, it's important to mention that um, in the history of the Kurdish resistance, prisons have always been an important site of struggle. Uh, but also at the same time, we think that uh, we need to think beyond um, the current systems that are made available to us. And of course, uh, the most important, the most well-known political prisoner um, of Kurdistan, Mr. Abdullah Öcalan, who is considered to be the political leader and a thinker by millions of Kurdish people, is currently held on Imrela Prison Island since 1999 uh, and is subjected to a regime of isolation. So we also want to protest, as we always do as part of the Kurdish women's movement, his isolation and uh, demand his freedom, just as we demand the freedom for all political prisoners and the dismantling of the prison systems as we know them. So just a few political, uh, sorry, <laughs> logistical points. Um, people can have joined us now on Zoom, but we're also live streaming. So you can ask uh, questions in the Zoom chat or on the YouTube comment section, both will be monitored. And if you uh, want to uh, ask a question, please submit it in written form. Uh, we will monitor the chats and make sure that we can ask uh, questions at the end. If you want to ask a question specifically, uh, so please do ask uh, questions specifically, address them to the panelists that you want uh, them to, to answer. Um, so this is it for now. Um, we very much look forward to, to this event. Uh, we have an amazing lineup of speakers, as I mentioned, um, from different parts of the world. And the first speaker is um, unfortunately not able to join us um, in person, but she has submitted a video and uh, she uh, has sent it to us from Palestine. Uh, Dr. Yara Hawari is a Palestinian feminist, uh, writer, and senior policy analyst, analyst for Al Shabaka. Uh, she's based in pa Palestine and she's an activist of the recently more and more growing Talat a movement, uh, a feminist movement that has taken over the streets of Palestine. Um, in addition to her uh, academic work, uh, which focused on um, indigenous studies and oral history. She's also a frequent political commentator, writing for various media outlets, including The Guardian, Foreign Policy, and Al Jazeera English. And she frequently documents and reports on abuses committed by Israeli occupation forces in Palestine. So now we will first listen to what Yara says. And after that, I will uh, introduce our other speakers. Um, I think there is a slight technical problem. We'll just wait for a few more seconds. Um. Me on this panel, I'm sorry that I can't be there on screen live. Thank you so much to our comrades for having me on this panel. I'm sorry that I can't be there on screen live with you all, um, but I hope uh, that I'll be able to offer uh, a short presentation um, and a discussion about uh, the Palestinian political prisoners held in uh, Israeli detention and in Israeli prisons. Um, I think it's always super important to do these panels, um, to be in solidarity with each other, to connect our struggles, because more often than not, the, the structures of oppression um, that repress us are linked 
Um, they're linked in, in many different ways, um, quite often materially as well as um, ideologically, uh, especially in, in the case of Israel, uh, which is a regime that outsources its technologies uh, and uh, uh, security um, to the world so that it can repress other populations. So I think it's always very important to do these kinds of things. Now I'm going to talk to you um, about the Palestinian um, political prisoners. Israel has been arresting uh, Palestinians since it was established uh, in 1948 as a, as a Jewish and, and Zionist state. Um, and uh, the secure Israeli security services um, and the Israeli prison system have been uh, holding Palestinians um, for political activity um, um, since then. Um, and in, usually in, in, in that type of detention, in that type of incarceration, there are all kinds of uh, methods of, uh, of torture, uh, 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 including psychological torture, which is used uh, against Palestinians in an attempt to to break them and to break their political spirit, but also um, to break uh, organizing, political organizing outside of the prisons as well. Um, so in 1948, Israel was established as a, as a Jewish uh, and Zionist state on top of um, Palestine. Uh, it was, it's a continuous settler colonial project which means that it is seeking to erase the indigenous uh, Palestinian population. In 1967, it went on to occupy um, the areas of Palestine that it could not occupy in 1948, which is the West Bank, um, Gaza, but also the, the occupied Syrian Golan. Now, what it did was it established a system of military uh, rule over the 67 territories, which it had done in 1948 over the 48 territories, but it lifted that, that form of military rule and um, imposed it on uh, uh, the West Bank and Gaza and the Syrian Golan. And under that military um, regime or uh, occupation, we can call it, they set up a uh, military uh, court system. Uh, now, this um, uh, military court system is the main way that that Palestinians are arrested and put through um, the Israeli incarceration system. And of course it's separate to uh, the Israeli um, civilian court system. In the uh, Israeli military courts, um, it's something like 99.9% .9 of uh, cases um, Palestinians are found guilty of. Uh, crimes uh, or so-called crimes that have been made up by the by the Israeli regime. The military court system allows for um, is the Israeli army, Israeli forces to go and uh, to arrest uh, Palestinians wherever they are in the West Bank. And may I remind you that the West Bank it, uh, and Gaza are contained, uh, considered under international law um, as uh, Palestinian territory, although international law, uh, I'd like to point out, is not, you know, the, um, the barometer of, by which we as Palestinians consider as Palestine. Um, but the West Bank is, uh, uh, and the Gaza Strip are supposed to be uh, um, territory designated for a future Palestinian state. Um, but of course we know uh, currently the political situation uh, that that is uh, a facade, a political facade uh, that is used to, uh, to continue the, the oppression of the Palestinian people. In the West Bank the areas are, are divided up into different uh, delineations of control between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli regime. Now that uh, really is also a facade. The Israeli regime has control over the complete territory and they can take and arrest Palestinians um, whenever they want. Uh, uh, and that really is the case and we see it, we really see it happening daily. Now when um, Palestinians are arrested, they are um, interrogated uh, for, um, for uh, information. Uh, they are inter interrogated um, in order to um, uh, uh, also to indict themselves um, 
uh, and the Israelis, uh, the Israeli armies and the Israeli security services use all kinds of methods during this interrogation process. They are often then uh, put forward to a military court. Um, this military court system is, in, is incredibly arduous and long. Often trials are postponed and postponed um, and the trials are um, held before a military judge uh, and as I mentioned before, um, in nearly all cases they are fi found uh, guilty. Now, by, according to Israeli military orders, Palestinians can be held without charge um, for a period of, of, of 90 days and so that, and those 90 days mean uh, during those 90 days often uh, Palestinian prisoners do not uh, have any contact with the outside world, have very little contact with any uh, lawyers. So it's a very dangerous and scary uh, time for the prisoners, for their families. Um, uh, and then once uh, they finally have uh, a sentencing, these sentences are often uh, um, incredibly um, exaggerated. Um, so this entire system is not only not only um, is it unjust, it's, it's considered um, illegitimate by the international legal regime. Uh, and yet Israel uh, continues to, to incarcerate Palestinians um, through the system. Now the current number of Palestinians that are, are held as political prisoners as of uh, May this year is about 4,600. Of those 4,600, um, 40 are uh, female uh, prisoners and 170 are children. Um, and, and Israel is uh, one of the main uh, regimes that is guilty of incarcerating um, minors um, and um, abusing uh, the rights of, of children. And also, um, um, some of, among those prisoners are also uh, Palestinian um, politicians or legislative council members. Um, now, the the whole system is incredibly violent uh, towards the prisoners. The prisons themselves, as you can imagine, often lack um, health and proper health and uh, sanitation. They are very crowded. Um, they lack proper health care, um, and they have uh, um, very limited um, access to uh, the outside world. And interestingly, actually, female prisoners um, are in uh, a much worse uh, are in much worse conditions uh, than their their male comrades. The female uh, um, political prisoners are held in a prison in uh, um, called the Damun prison, which is a prison near uh, the city of Haifa. Um, and uh, they face all kinds of uh, gendered violence. Now, uh, the, some, just some of the, the examples of uh, gendered violence um, is threats of uh, sexual harassment, threats of rape, um, often uh, they face physical uh, sexual harassment. Um, they are denied um, quite frequently uh, access to uh, sanitary products. They are um, uh, not given uh, proper uh, female health care. Um, so there are many ways in which the Israeli regime sort of uses uh, women's bodies against them. And uh, that's also something that the Israeli regime holds in common with with many other oppressive regimes. Um, uh, and in general, the, the Israeli prison system, they are guilty of, of torturing all Palestinian political prisoners, women, men and children. Uh, they use various different methods of torture, including you know, beatings, positional torture, uh, solitary confinement is a common one. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, sexual torture, um, including uh, 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 threats of, uh, of rape um, against children, um, and, and also threats on family members outside the prison. Um, so all of these, you know, not only leave like a 
leave physical damage on, on the prisoners, but also um, place great emotional strain. Um, and, and they have a deep and, and lasting um, effects. Uh, and there are many actors uh, that are complicit um, in this system, not just the military court system, uh, but med Israeli medical personnel, um, uh, which uh, have often been complicit in the torture of, of Palestinian detainees and prisoners. Um, now, uh, um, the current situation in Palestine with regards to prisoners, as I mentioned already, uh, the statistics, the Israeli army is able to come into the West Bank, is already in the West Bank, but is able to come into Palestinian cities and villages whenever they want. They uh, can arrest people whenever they want. They have a highly sophisticated uh, surveillance regime uh, it, all over the West Bank. The West Bank is, and, and the Gaza Strip is basically completely surveilled and Israel has access and is able to see everything that goes on. So when they, they, they come to arrest someone, they know exactly uh, where that person is and, and how to take them more often than not. But this is also facilitated through um, one particular uh, policy um, that's called the security coordination. And this is something that uh, existed between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli army. Now, the Palestinian Authority, I must stress, is, is different to the Palestinian Liberation Organization. The Palestinian Authority was established after the Oslo Accords in the 90, early 90s as a sort of interim government um, until uh, Palestinian statehood uh, would be achieved. Now, Palestinian statehood has not been achieved, um, and the, the Palestinian Authority remains as a sort of de facto government. Now, the, the Palestinian Authority is heavily uh, reliant on donor funding, and a lot of that donor funding is contingent on something called the security coordination. The security coordination is where the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli army coordinate and share information in order to thwart uh, so-called terrorism. Um, in other words, the Palestinian Authority shares information, um, and when the Israelis, uh, the Israeli army want to come into the West Bank or uh, they, as I said, they, they are in the West Bank, they maintain um, a heavy presence, but when they want to come into um, areas of Palestinian Authority so-called control, uh, they coordinate with the Palestinian authorities and they can go in and do whatever they want without any challenge from the Palestinian authorities. And um, this existed and continues to exist, although the Palestinian Authority president ha announced recently the cancellation of this coordination. However, um, I uh, and, and many of my uh, comrades have yet to see sort of uh, sort of concrete evidence of that. But regardless, this is a coordination that, as I said, allows is, uh, the Israeli army to arrest often uh, young Palestinian activists, um, um, and quite more often than not. Uh, they are political opponents of the Palestinian Authority, which is incredibly convenient. So the current situation uh, in, in uh, the 67 territories is one where many uh, young uh, Palestinian political activists and organizers are arrested, um, are held uh, in detention, uh, are incarcerated. And this is what makes it very difficult uh, for Palestinians to, to maintain a kind of continuous movement or resistance because it is incredibly um, disruptive when you have um, members of a movement um, in and out of prison. Um, uh, not only has, does it take a huge emotional uh, and physical uh, toll, uh, it also you know, stops uh, the movement or any kind of organizing in its tracks. Um, so this is this was a short overview. There are many things that, that I missed out, um, uh, and I'm aware of that. But I'm also uh, aware of uh, you know aware of the time. Um, but perhaps just some some concluding uh, some concluding thoughts is that you know the Israeli regime is a settler colonial regime. It's a patriarchal regime. It uses uh, it uses uh, um, these sort of intersections of colonialism, capitalism and patriarchy to continually oppress the Palestinian people. 
um, uh, and unfortunately as well uh, a lot of Palestinian resistance has failed uh, certainly in recent years to acknowledge those intersections um, of, of structures of power and I think I do believe that that failure is, is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to maintain a continuous um, continuous resistance movement against the Israeli regime. Um, for more information on uh, Palestinian prisoners, um, uh, I would really recommend um, the organization Damir. Uh, Damir is one of the, really the only organizations that, that focuses on the rights of Palestinian uh, political prisoners and they have a lot of statistics um, and um, important reports and information um, so uh, please uh, if you do want more information because I realize that I missed a lot out please um, see their work and I hope um, that we can uh, that I can join you uh, all again in the future and I hope that we maintain these links because as I said they're they're so important to tackle these um, greater um, and interlinking uh, structures of power, solidarity and, uh, uh, and love and support during this time. This was a great um, presentation from Yara, who gave us a fantastic overview about what's been happening in Palestine, an ongoing situation. And unfortunately, she won't be uh, joining us during the Q&A. But as you have heard, uh, there are ways of getting in touch with her and people who are organizing around these issues. Um, just to say this again, uh, you can post your comments uh, on the Zoom chat or on YouTube and we will take them at the end. Now, we're very excited to um, introduce uh, our next speakers, Njira Keith and Christina Brown. Uh, Jira Keith is a diaspora-oriented uh, Black organizer whose focus is the development of movement philosophy and infrastructure that supports uh, cohesion and unity in revolutionary struggle. In 2017, she published um, Sovereign Song, Words from the Revolution, and she's the founder and former executive coordinator of a Black Sovereign Nation. Uh, she's also the co-founder of 401, a Black Cooperative Federation, a liberatory blueprint, and a framework for dramatic economic and political shifts in global Black life. Christina Brown uh, is a social uh, epidemiologist by training uh, with a speciality in the identification and assessment of disparities of race and gender. Uh, principally oriented in Black revolutionary struggle, Christina is fascinated by the utility of spirit, culture, and communications to define and cultivate a revolutionary agenda. She's the co-founder and executive director of Counterbalance, ATX, and most recently she co-founded 401, the world's first black cooperative federation and counterbalances parent organization to build economic and political power across the diaspora. Uh, it's her hope that this framework will be a vehicle for mass movement and results in uh, propelling black folks to a world unimaginable but beyond survival. So it's a great pleasure to have you two here and I'll um, give, you, uh, give the microphone to you. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. So before we jump in, we want to just talk a little bit about um, who we are and give context for our perspectives. Uh, I was born and raised in Austin, Texas in the United States. Um, as was already said, I did a lot of autonomy organizing in Texas with uh, Black Sovereign Nation that ultimately contributed to the founding of 401. And hi, everyone. I'm Christina. Um, grew up in Arizona in the States and also did a lot of grassroots organizing in Austin, Texas, um, specifically with Black women around the naming of our oppression and the mobilization of people power locally. Um, that also led me to the work with 401. And we founded 401 um, to better sustain uh, Black revolutionary struggle globally and specifically in the United States. We were finding that um, our movements are under-resourced, um, especially if 
uh, when it resists the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, and we wanted to create a cohesive strategy for um, abolition and revolution and uh, ultimately freedom. Um, so uh, within the context of prison abolition, some of the work that we've done so far is a campaign called We Must Heal Ourselves, which uh, we launched with 10 other folks, 10 other um, Black women who identified as survivors to kind of shift community responses to sexual harm in a way that rejected the carceral system, prisons, and the criminal justice system overall. Yes, another effort um, is our community bail fund. Um, and we intentionally raise funds for folks who are too poor to get out of jail um, with the prioritization of Black, trans, and other marginalized groups. Mm -hmm. And currently we are engaged in a destabilization study and we believe that our destabilization experiments are uh, really crucial to developing strong strategy for abolishing institutions like prisons and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we want to start with conversation about, you know, what a womanist prison abolitionist praxis looks like. Um, and it's very important to center women in the discussion and to take leadership from incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, incarcerated women and gender nonconforming folks. This panel is exemplifying feminist values by curating an all woman panel, but it definitely could be more inclusive and more radical if we centered women who have been um, incarcerated or who have experience navigating the carceral system and also trans women as they are consistently left out of these conversations and one of the most disproportionately impacted groups. Um, we also have to think about the state of reproductive health as a result of the carceral system in the prison industrial complex um, and making reprodu reproductive revolution a driving political force of prison abolition is a key component of um, maintaining a feminist perspective. So how are women criminalized for the choices that they make about their bodies? Um, it's still a crime in many areas of the world to have an abortion. Um, in the US, autonomous or community facilitated or um, self-managed abortions are also criminalized in many states. Further, Black women specifically are targeted by the carceral system through child protective services and other state agencies that criminalize their motherhood. Um, and the children of those Black parents are subjected to the school to prison pipeline. So when we're thinking about uh, what folks traditionally consider women's issues, um, the carceral system is often at the center of them. Yes. And now let's get into um, 401, our relationship to the prison industrial complex as a federation. So 401 is an abolitionist framework and a black cooperative federation. It exists to develop a revolutionary vanguard capable of destabilizing and dismantling the Western hegemonic um, power structure and empowering and equipping black communities to build an alternative to systems, institutions, and cultures of harm and oppression. We accomplished that through our leadership development program praxis of history for black revolutionaries and through the development of what we call L3s, which are black intentional living communities. 401 does not engage in the state or the carceral system at all um, while navigating conflict or addressing harm. All of our members pledge to never contact the law enforcement and seek alternatives to criminal justice system for the duration of their federation membership. Our L2 collective works together to create and implement solutions to harm that are alternatives to punitive punishment and carceral culture. These alternatives will be implemented throughout the entire Federation. Our L4 collective is committed to learning from moments of organic destabilization, as Indira mentioned earlier, to inform offensive abolitionist strategy. We believe that these systems, that the systems are dismantled by force and by people. We can never expect the state to fully abolish itself. 401 Deepu believes in using these moments when systems are vulnerable to attack them. 
We believe that moments of destabilization contribute to that vulnerability. For example, COVID-19 destabilized the prison system. We saw the results of the way the prison reform um, in the way of prison reform and prison abolition. Um, for example, Fox News reported in April that over 16,000 prison individuals had been released in the United States since COVID, um, the COVID crisis began. The majority were being held on nonviolent charges or were deemed to be a not an immediate threat to society if released. Internationally, in Italy, an article cites that over 50 prison uprising had occurred just in March in response to anxiety around COVID-19. So on March 16th, the government adopted a decree, among other measures, that would allow for early supervised release of prisoners with less than 18 months left on their sentence. This measure is estimated to result in the release of more than 3,000 detainees. Finally, in Michigan, um, their population has dropped 5.2% over three months during the COVID-19 pandemic. Michigan has also relaxed its parole um, violation policies, as well as shifting to community-based educational programming for drug treatment, sexual offense. Um, and these are measures approved by the state, which we know will never result, like we said, in the abolition of prisons, but present a small glimpse of what is possible in moments of destabilization where people power weakens the hold of the state. Imagine what is possible in these moments um, when these moments are intentionally exploited by revolutionaries wielding that same people power for the purpose of abolition rather than momentary incremental change. So building on what Christina is saying, um, 401 is looking for and is hoping for people powered abolition versus um, state sanctioned abolitionist reforms. So right now in the United States and after the murder of George Floyd, many organizations and collectives have adopted abolitionist demands that build on the Black Lives Matter movement. And the popular demand right now is that local governments defund police um, with some municipal governments even considering disbanding their police departments. So these are really amazing steps, um, but we believe that they should be carried out by the people and not by the state. We believe that the people should use force to implement these changes. Um, we believe that um, abolition that is catalyzed or facilitated by the state will not lead to the state's own abolishment, right? So we are system abolitionists, right? So it's not just police or just prisons alone that need to be abolished in order for us to experience um, Black liberation and eventually human and global universal liberation. Um, we have to abolish the whole state, the whole system. Um, and so we, we think that, again, abolition that is catalyzed or facilitated by the state won't lead to the state's abolishment and it won't undergird the power of community. Um, we believe it will further validate the state as an authority. And that's something that we want to avoid. So we have to strike you know, a really delicate balance there. Uh, within the context of prison abolition, it's 401's position that collectives and organizations should support, bolster, and undergird the power of incarcerated populations so that they can build and execute uprisings that will result in the overpowering of the state and the reclamation of their bodies, their labor, their freedom, and other resources. Um, this requires engagement in Marxist-Leninist vanguardism, as well as the intentional development of free space and maroonage for formerly incarcerated and hopefully self-liberated people. Um, when we're thinking about prison abolition, we are not just thinking about um, dismantling and destabilizing the prison or carceral system, right? We're also thinking about um, alternatives to um, 
that punitive way or that punitive culture of addressing harm. So 401 is committed to implementing and establishing alternatives to prison as a way to both strengthen the abolitionist position and encourage communities to turn to those alternatives as opposed to continuing to engage the carceral system. Um, we're still learning and experimenting within our own federation. So most of this implementation is happening internally. Um, but some of those alternatives might look like, well, first and foremost, creating systems that acknowledge that safety and healing are community endeavors. And that, that when an individual within our community experiences harm, it's because the community as a whole has failed to create a safe and, and healing environment, not just because of the harm that was perpetrated by one single individual. Um, this means that when we talk about accountability or implement solutions that center accountability, the community as a whole must be prepared to contribute to restoration of harm as opposed to expecting one person to shoulder um, that labor or, or take all of that um, blame or culpability. For example, if someone steals bread or milk, this is an indication of the community's failure to make food and sustenance available and equitably accessible and not necessarily a reflection of the individual's own behavioral shortcomings, right? Um, so abolishing prisons uh, and creating alternatives means understanding root causes and creating infrastructures that um, can remedy these issues. Um, and, and that infrastructure might look like community accountability models in which folks who have committed harm are um, supported or supervised by members of their own family, their own community, and their own networks in ways that um, support the individual's own desire to restore harm and shift um, their patterns of behavior. Um, it can look like treatment programs, as we know that prisons are not appropriate spaces for rehabilitation. Um, how are we creating spaces that are rehabilitative? Um, I think that this is something that 401 um, tries to incorporate um, in its culture across the board. And this is something that communities and organizations and collectives can do. Make every space rehabilitative, right? Every time people are coming together, make it a healing and a transformational space. Um, that is doing that is engaging in a prison abolitionist praxis. Um, uh, developing restorative or accountability circles. Sometimes it's up to the person most affected by the harm to define what restoration looks like. And accountability circles often give those folks the opportunity to do that and to engage in self-determination. Yeah. So what are concrete steps that people can take now in the United States specifically, uh, but some of these things can be applied um, internationally to abolish prisons, right? So don't call the police. Um, or cooperate with law enforcement ever in any situation. Contribute to bail funds, specifically those that prioritize Black, trans, and other directly marginalized groups. Use restorative justice or mediation to resolve conflict rather than putative um, or carceral punishment. Seek the leadership of directly incarcerated folks and invest in revolutionary frameworks engaged in offensive action against the prison industrial complex. Free them all. So we're gonna uh, wrap up and in conclusion, I just wanna say that right now we are witnessing an unprecedented vulnerability in US systems of oppression, um, especially in institutions of white supremacy and general harm. When we see this phenomenon um, occurring or happening in other places throughout the world, it's often accompanied by mass uprising that catalyzes regime change and major transformation in social, institutional, and government infrastructure. So we should not shy away from that right now. We should not allow our energy to be reabsorbed by reform, by the nonprofit industrial complex, or by charitable endeavors. We have a responsibility to preserve our energy and harness it specifically for revolutionary endeavors, for mass movement, for transformational change. So I just want to um, end by encouraging us to stay grounded in our principles. Let's keep the end goal, prison abolition in our sights, and let's continue to resist. Thank you all so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Indira and Christina, for this um, amazing uh, presentation of, uh, of what kind of alternative system is possible. And I think what you have just spoken about very much resonates with some of the perspectives of the Kurdish liberation movement, because when we talk about abolishing the system, we also talk about building the new when we speak about uh, radical perspectives built from from below from people so i really hope these conversations can uh, continue and be taken further thank you so much um i think there's so much to think about and reflect on um, um so now we will move on to uh, aisha baktai uh, she's an activist of um of tevgerajin and azad uh, the women's freedom movement and a member of the People's Democratic Party HDP Women's Assembly. She's a translator, writer, um, politician, um, peace and women's liberation struggle activist. And she's been involved in the struggle for freedom, equality, justice, and socialism since her university years. Um, in, since 1993, she's been actively involved in the feminist struggle. And she was part of the No to War on Iraq uh, coordination in Turkey and in the global anti-war movement, which developed with the World Social Forum. Um, she's one of the initiators and uh, coordinators um, of the World Tribunal on Iraq. And she was part of the Diyarbakir Prison Truth and Justice Commission, uh, the Women's Peace Initiative and the Women's Freedom Assembly. And she will be joining us now from Turkey. Aisha? Yes. Uh, I have to open that. Okay. Sorry for this. <laughs> uh, greetings uh, to everyone. Uh, from uh, from Istanbul uh, and thank you uh, for uh, inviting uh, for uh, um, organizing this and being uh, making us able to participate in this uh, panel which we think is very valuable and important and um, it's um, I'm uh, as uh, as Dilar said, I'm from uh, Tegrej. I'm a an uh, Azad activist, uh, the Kurdish Women's Freedom Movement, and also I'm a member of uh, the Women's Assembly of P People's uh, Democratic Party. In uh, in Turkey, we've been uh, in Turkey and Kurdistan. In uh, we've been uh, we've been. Uh, involved time and again uh, with uh, struggles and actions uh, linked to uh, prisoners uh, but uh, as a perspective as Dilar said again uh, we have a, we have a perspective of uh, dismantling the prison system but uh, Thinking about it until now, our, uh, we, have, we have a perspective of uh, building a new, dismantling this prison system and replacing, an alter replacing it with an alternative. But um, uh, our struggle, um, our struggle mainly have been linked, have been um, uh, devoted mainly to uh, fighting back on happening about uh, I mean we've been uh, the most uh, we we've been uh, protesting against what the state is doing in link uh, connection with the prisoners prison and the prisoners and we've been uh, demonstrating uh, to stop the state from uh, uh, doing what is doing with the prison. Uh, 
this this has the, the violence of the state attack on prisons and prisoners it has been so great that we've been mostly preoccupied with a uh, solidarity with prisons and prisoners it's uh, so uh, we have uh, the political prisoners in turkey we the turkish state has no uh, has uh, has not identified anybody as political prisoners, but they rather uh, call you as terrorists, call us as terrorists. So, uh, it, it's uh, and uh, the political prisoners in Turkey they have a special prison uh, built for. We have special prisoners, prisons built for political prisoners. They call them F-type prisons. They are cells, solitary confinement cells. And it's, uh, it's at most uh, three prisoners in one cell. And uh, they have one separate, uh, uh, what you call it, place where they go outside, this closed enclosure, this enclosed place where they go outside uh, for limited hours. And then they're also within the same prison, at that prison, there's also the cell for a uh, single person. And all of these, uh, every three cell opens to one courtyard, hmm. the name is courtyard, one courtyard, and, uh, but they cannot go there at the same time, at different times, they go there at different times. So the whole architecture of the prison uh, and the technical uh, aspect of the prison is designed to keep prisoners from getting in contact with each other. And uh, it, uh, this is the architectural and uh, technical aspect. Then there is also the uh, administrative aspect, which is, uh, uh, which, which is which according to, uh, on the basis of which the administration the prison administration uh, just uh, very ad arbitrarily and its own will uh, plays around and imposes and controls prisoners life with measures arbitrary measures so it's um, it is a system this f-type prison system is a system uh, which was uh, established in in the year I think 2000, uh, 2000 and it uh, the discussions about the, this F-type prison system and the isolation system began in the second half of the 80s after 1984, and it uh, after uh, in 1988. There was uh, the first step, and discussions were taken with a government decree, and uh, there were big protests against it, and uh, they weren't able to implement this uh, decree. But in uh, later on, uh, they in 1991, uh, they uh, uh, but the state passed anti-terror law and in the anti-terror law it was stated that the terrorist prisoners would be kept in confinement they wouldn't be able to see each other they wouldn't be able to do this they wouldn't be able to have uh, visitors uh, face to face visitors just uh, on the phone visitors so uh, it was a uh, this 1991 and then we had uh, there were several uh, uprisings and the, the prisons are in our country prisons are a site of struggle before this uh, before the f type prisons and uh, we mainly had the ward system and uh, the prisons uh, were a site of resistance and struggle and education they still are but the state is taking its uh, has uh, decided to take it measures against this to prevent this from happening. Before uh, the uh, 
in the in the uh, before this uh, the current time it was uh, they in prisons were a place of uh, torture and um, I mean physical repression and oppression physical uh, punishment but uh, then with uh, uh, it's said that it is with the uh, with education training from the U.S. prison system, this uh, idea of uh, not just uh, punishing, but uh, designing, designing the life of and controlling and uh, psychologically and in everyday life and by all means, controlling the prisoner's life. Uh, uh, the, the various systems of following is, uh, I mean, like in, in with, a, with an eye of the administration and the state constantly there following what the prisoner is doing and trying to control and change uh, and to break his will, the prison, his and her will, uh, the prisoner's will. This was, uh, this, uh, they have become more and more, uh, uh, they have become better at this. They have made themselves better at, at doing this. But the uh, prisons have not submitted. They have not given in. And uh, there's the top of what what's happening right now. Uh, it was uh, the, uh, the, Kurdish people's leader, uh, Mr. Abdullah Öcalan, being put in Imralı prison and the system of isolation imposed on him. Uh, it was tried out uh, and uh, experimented and it's, uh, they, uh, and the people, the, when they were able to implement their system there, then they decided to, uh, they did not succeed, of course, in breaking, but they it just pressed them, and then they started implementing it in all prisons throughout the country. So the prisons are a type of story art, and uh, in spite of all this, uh, in spite of all, this is what the effect I'm telling you about is the, the, the state, uh, the state, what they are trying to do. Their, their, their actions against the prisoners. I mean, able, they were able to implement uh, to implement the F type prison. They had they broke, they raided, attacked, and killed many prisoners who were on hunger strike against this prison system. They started implementing the F type uh, prison system, and currently uh, we have uh, this system and in. Uh, and others uh, combine combined with it, and in, in like now we have uh, around uh, we have uh, there are right now three hundred thousand uh, prisoners uh, in general in Turkish pr in prisons of this country, and it's uh, with the Corona virus. Uh, Pandemia, they passed an amnesty uh, setting free uh, around 95,000 prisoners. And uh, the political prisoners were uh, uh, specifically omitted. Uh, they, they were not uh, political prisoners, are still in prison of Turkey. And the, the prisons are overcrowded. The prisons are uh, designed for, uh, it's about, they have a capacity of uh, 220,000 people. So it's, uh, uh, they are overcrowded and is in very un unhealthy condition. And in fact, the state has uh, uh, abandoned, has decided to abandon uh, the political prisoners uh, to uh, die at the hands of the pandemia. Against this, for example, we uh, we had uh, we had protests and 
it was uh, women leading these protests all the time here in, in, in Turkey and Kurdistan. And it's, uh, uh, we in, in, in these prisons, we also have more than 3,000 children are also in prison. It's, uh, and uh, political women are especially being targeted in these times of pandemia. After all this talk about everybody keeping safe, everybody keeping at home, and uh, be, they are still, uh, and like the talk that this, in, in our country, uh, people above 65, 65 plus years of age, and below uh, 18 years of age uh, were uh, on restriction. They weren't able to go, we weren't able to go outside our home for two months. Uh, but the others were free to go. So uh, it, in, in the context of all these measures, uh, so-called measures, uh, it, uh, the uh, prisons were uh, kept as a site which was uh, left, uh, people were left to their own fate and at the hand of the prison guard and it, uh, the, uh, there's a lots of um, uh, like ours uh, in our party in, in uh, for example HDP People's Democratic Party we have uh, we we have uh, around uh, seven thousand people in prison right now and there are lots of women among them and uh, like elected deputies are even elected uh, co-mayors uh, are in prison, hundreds of them, and uh, hundreds of uh, activists of the uh, Tevgere Jinan Azad are uh, the Kurdish women's freedom movement are in prison. And uh, the, the state is especially targeting uh, women's uh, institutions and organizations uh, to break women's struggle. But, uh, it is uh, one of our priorities uh, to uh, get our uh, comrades out of prison, but uh, it, the, the, this uh, depends, of course, on uh, the struggle that needs to be waged uh, against this uh, unjust uh, system as a whole. But especially against uh, this, uh, at this uh, finally, what we saw at the latest in this times of pandemia, uh, that they let uh, uh, murderers go. This, uh, the, I mean, they released uh, the gang, uh, uh, the, the the gang leaders, uh, the, uh, the their. Uh, the people that, uh, uh, like, uh, they, they released all other people and they just, they let the uh, uh, po political prisoners in, in prison. So uh, this, uh, this is, uh, we are waging a struggle against this because we believe this is this uh, inequality and injustice uh, needs to be uh, immediately corrected. We are also waging struggle against the uh, solitary confinement system uh, in FSAI prisons and uh, also in the island of Imrada. It's uh, the, the solitary confinement system. Uh, it's in many countries, not just in Turkey. What's happening in the islands of Imrili is something above this, it's beyond this. It's a person all by himself, a, a, a political figure, a philosopher, all by himself in a prison island for more than 20 years now. It's uh, just beyond anything else. But also in the 
political in the uh, time uh, as concerns the political prisoners, uh, we uh, are uh, we are uh, confident. I mean, we we think that uh, this uh, state of uh, prisons being used as uh, places of uh, uh, control. Uh, it's uh, uh, places where control is practiced to the utmost, uh, and uh, prisoners uh, are uh, uh, punished by, twice by being confined in a prison and then being confined within the confinement. It's double confinement, it's solitary confinement. So it's uh, uh, we need, we think that uh, this is a, a torture system. In fact. And uh, uh, it, it, we need uh, to find ways of uh, uh, we, we need to find uh, ways of uh, uh, building solidarity and struggle, uh, international solidarity and struggle against this uh, system of uh, control and confinement. It's closing people up, but closing them up for uh, like they are they have life sentence. And they have to live in a cell all by themselves until they die. So it's without having contact with anybody else. So this this is uh, this is uh, inhuman. And in fact, the prison system in itself, which allows this, this is this this is the length to which to which it can go. But in fact, it is the prison system. Which enables uh, all this. Uh, it can be. It depends on. Uh, it depends. It uh, anything that is dependent on uh, what the state uh, will decide and will do is uh, something that's very risky for people. So uh, and it's. Uh, we believe that the prison system, which allows, uh, gives such a uh, the, such an opportunity. To to the state uh, needs uh, to be changed. It's, uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I think this conversation is very valuable. It's, it's uh, giving us a bigger perspective of uh, a wider, broader perspective of what uh, uh, what to dream about. What to, uh, I mean, to uh, because uh, it's something we call it in in Turkish with tahayyul. It's what you uh, think about, what uh, to, you you can imagine. It, it gives us something that uh, shows us that there are other ways we can imagine the world. And it's, uh, I think it's imprisoning people, confining people, uh, closing people up is uh, something uh, something very barbaric to do. And it, it depends, it's not about changing or uh, uh, changing them or uh, educating in court it's it, it's not about transforming uh, people but it's about uh, sub making them uh, uh, submit to uh, making them subservient it's not about uh, doing Something good for the society, but it's about doing about uh, doing uh, something, making them, uh, fitting them in line, harmonizing them with what the state state how how it, the state wants them to be. So it's uh, very important that we can talk on this and we can uh, see the horizons. Uh, the, that our horizons are not as limited and uh, find ways of cooperating. I think one of the most most important things that we can do is uh, to find ways of uh, uh, establishing some sort of uh, communication between the prisoners themselves, that uh, find ways, uh, develop means, like them writing letters to each other, I don't know how, but uh, linking the uh, prison prisoners themselves and uh, it would be, I think, something uh, very good.
this is uh, how, uh, I will end saying is Jun uh, Jian Azadi, life, woman, life, and freedom, as uh, our uh, slogan goes. And thank you so much, Aisha Berktai, for your valuable. Um, overview of the situation in Turkey and Northern Kurdistan and also for um, pointing out how systems of oppression are learning from each other because we know of course that the uh, Turkish prison system has been very much influenced by the US prison system and um, and that um, prison systems are primarily designed also to break people's political will um, and also you have mentioned how uh, many of the policies that are now imposed on the people in Turkey in general are first tested in the prisons and actually first tested on Imrala Prison Island on Mr. Abdullah Öcalan, who, as we know, is the negotiator for peace in the talks between the Kurdish freedom movement and Turkey. So thank you so much, Aisha, for your insights. Um, now our next speaker. Um, oh, before I announce the next speaker, I want to remind everybody that you can send in questions, but please try to direct your question at specific speakers, just because we probably won't have time for all the speakers to answer all the questions. So it would be great if you can ask um, specific questions. Um, and now I will announce um, Glenis Balangu Delkiran, who's a Filipino researcher and activist. Um, she's the coordinator of Ibon Europe, based in Brussels in Belgium. Uh, she's the representative, uh, which is the representative office of Ibon International in Europe. Um, this is a Philippine-based service institution that cooperates mainly with social movements and civil society constituencies in all regions of the world, especially in the global south and among marginalized groups. Um, the, the organization believes that addressing the roots of poverty, inequality, exclusion, environmental destruction and injustice entails a process of social transformation a process of building people's sovereignty uh, to self-organize, self-mobilize, and serve as development actors in their own right. Um, it campaigns and advocates against militarism and aggression, and it's a member of uh, the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines. And in the Philippines, Glennis wor worked with uh, Ivan Foundation, an independent and leading research think tank on socioeconomic issues from 2004 to February 2018 as senior researcher. So um, thank you so much, Glennis, for joining us. Um, and I will uh, let you give us your presentation now. Thank you. Thank you, Dilar. Good evening to everyone. Um, I'm very honored to um, be here with you today. And uh, I am going to share with you the uh, situation of political prisoners in the Philippines, their campaigns and their calls. So first, um, let me introduce you to the state of Philippine prisons. According to government data, Philippine prisons have a congestion rate of 534%. It holds the record of highest jail occupancy in the world. Aside from this, lack of food, sanitation, and other basic needs contribute to the extremely inhumane conditions of prisoners in the Philippines. Moreover, there have been a lot of reports of high level corruption in prisoner treatment with highly influential and wealthy prisoners, including drug lords, living like kings inside prisons. And more recently, the business of prison officials selling freedom to inmates through the good conduct time allowance came under public scrutiny. These are the conditions that political prisoners in the Philippines are subjected to. As of April 2020, there are 609 political prisoners in the Philippines, according to human rights group Karapatan. Of this, 97 are sick, many with life-threatening and debilitating illnesses, 55 are elderly, 5 were arrested as minors, and 98 are women. Of the 609, more than half were arrested under the Duterte government. 11 political prisoners are consultants of the National Democratic Front of the Philippines to the peace talks and are legally protected by the Joint Agreement on Safety and Immunity Guarantees. Without due process, 
political prisoners are charged with trumped up or fabricated charges, usually with the non-bailable charges of murder, arson, or kidnapping, and then illegal possession of firearms and explosives from planted evidence. The situation of um, women political prisoners in the Philippines reflects the double burden of oppression of women in society. There is lack of reproductive health and sanitation services and facilities for women prisoners, which is in direct violation of the Bangkok rules or the United Nations rules for the treatment of women prisoners and uncustodial measures for women offenders. Women visitors of political prisoners are subjected to degrading strip and sometimes cavity search. There have also been reports of sexual harassment by jail guards and authorities as documented by human rights groups. Ill treatment of women political detainees include non-provision of medicine to the sick, detained even if pregnant, gives birth in detention and living with their um, um, infants in detention. The disproportionately high number of political prisoners arrested and detained under uh, President Duterte's regime is the result of his government's militarist mindset and policy. Duterte appointed 73 former military and police officials to civilian positions in at least 46 agencies, many of them in national executive positions. He created the high-level, high-budget national task force to end local communist armed, co armed conflict, essentially to identify perceived enemies and to use the whole government machinery against them. Even the government's COVID-19 response is a highly militarized lockdown. The Duterte administration has greatly weaponized the law with the increased use of fabricated charges against government critics and activists and has led to the accumulation of political detainees. Yet, this is not enough for the government as cases of harassment of their families have been reported to break their spirits further. The militarist and heavy-handed strategy to quell dissent and opposition is aimed to stifle the strongest voices against, against its authoritarianism, corruption, and policies in reaching ruling elites. It complements and supports neoliberal and pro-elite economic policies such as privatization of public services, land monopolies, wage repression, and tax increases for the poor, and tax cuts for the rich. The left in the Philippines has been the most vocal and consistent force against the onslaught of neoliberalism, which has worsened chronic poverty, unemployment, rural bankruptcy, landlessness, and marginalization. The Philippine government's military response to the pandemic, which the UN called out alongside China, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and El Salvador, resulted in many cases of human rights violations. During the quarantine, relief volunteers were arrested and detained. Seven relief volunteers for farmers in need were arrested, detained, and charged with sedition. On May 1, that's Labor Day in the Philippines, 32 relief volunteers and 42 individuals protesting the murder of a relief coordinator were arrested and detained. People seeking government aid were also arrested, such as 21 urban poor members and six jeepney drivers. Jeepneys are major means of public transport in the Philippines. Calling on the government to allow them to operate and earn incomes were arrested. Five farmers were also killed by the military and a quarantine violator was shot dead by the police. A new anti-terror law that violates and threatens fundamental rights and freedoms enshrined in the Philippine Constitution and that people, Filipinos in the past have um, paid with their lives has been passed by Philippine legislators. Some of the vague, uh, some of the opposed provisions are vague and broad provisions, including the provision that government can declare a terrorist act by intent alone. Um, uh, the the uh, proposed law also allows surveillance on mere suspicion, travel ban even before a case is filed, warrantless arrest, and up to 24 days in detention even without charges, and there are no damages for wrongful accusation or detention. It gives wide-reaching powers of an anointed military-dominated body to implement the law. For example, um, that military-dominated body called the Anti-Terrorism Council will have the power to prescribe 
or designate who or which organization is a terrorist, order the military and the police to arrest without a warrant, etc. This proposed law, which uh, only needs the signature of the Philippine president as of today, seeks to cripple the most determined forces struggling for democratic social economic reforms. And who are these? They are the social activists, organizations of the basic sectors, progressives in and out of government. With this law, the government aims to suppress government critics, but even more so, the most consistent forces advancing pro-people socioeconomic reforms. If the government succeeds, it will be able to ram down the people's throats further neoliberal and authoritarian policies. Um, I will share with you in the next three slides the campaigns and calls of um, uh, human rights organizations, people's organizations in the Philippines, and um, the friends and relatives of political prisoners. In During the pandemic, um, we heard the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights urge government to release every person detained without sufficient legal basis, including political prisoners, and others detained simply for expressing critical or dissenting views. In the Philippines, we have an organizations of, organization of relatives of political prisoners called Kapatid, and they petitioned the Supreme Court on April 8 to temporarily release the sick and elderly prisoners on humanitarian grounds. The government released almost 10,000 prisoners, but like in the experience of um, Palestine and Turkey, they did not release the political prisoners. Already, the government, as of today, the government um, reported 745 persons deprived of liberty and 125 prison personnel have been infected by the, corona, the new coronavirus. And also, Dos dozens of um, inmates have reportedly died of unclear causes without being tested. Um, it is also recognized that um, the struggle for prison reforms is an important aspect of the uh, struggle for democracy. Inside prisons, political prisoners wage their struggle for prison reforms and at the same time demanding further just and immediate release. Political prisoners assert that they should have separate quarters according to the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. Together with their families, many detainees protest against questionable transfer to local jails that are under harsher and less secure conditions that compromises their access to, so, to a support system, especially for medical care and easier visitation for families based in the cities. They are also uh, protesting against arbitrary denial of visitation rights, for example, during holidays and um, other occasions. They also protest against degrading strip and cavity search of visitors, which is against the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners. Exposing dire conditions in jail of, of, of the prisoners themselves and their friends and relatives resulted in halting several unlawful restrictions such as denial of visitation rights against political prisoners in Metro Manila, the capital of the Philippines. And um, at the international level, uh, um, Filip uh, Filipino organizations and um, support organizations abroad are also launching their uh, solidarity and advocacy campaigns um, outside of the Philippines. Uh, recently, the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights released a report um, uh, that highlights the massive human rights violation under the Duterte government. Police and military visits and raids on NGOs are reportedly used to intimidate civil society, including during the COVID-19 lockdown. The report further adds that red tagging or labeling individuals or groups, including human rights defenders and NGOs as communists or terrorists has posed a serious threat to life, civil society and freedom of expression. The United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights Report recommends to drop politically motivated charges against human rights defenders, political opponents, journalists and media organizations, legal and judicial officials, trade unionists, church workers, and others and take legal measures to ensure their protection, particularly following threats, including of gender-based violence. 
And before this um, report, um, international organizations, including um, my organization, um, organized the International People's Tribunal in September 2018 and found the Duterte government guilty for gross and systemic violation of civil and political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, and national sovereignty, development, and international humanitarian law. The verdict of the tribunal, together with the testimony of witnesses, which include families of political prisoners, was transmitted as communication to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, Netherlands, to supplement the complaint against the Duterte government. The Filipino people in the Philippines and overseas launched campaigns for international solidarity to release all political prisoners and drop, trumped up charges against them. A great number of Filipinos, people's organizations, even business groups, big business groups and religious groups are fighting against the anti-terror law and expressions of international solidarity from people's movements and organizations on this issue are likewise crucial and invaluable. Finally, I will close this presentation to say that the Filipino people will steadfastly continue to struggle for a just and lasting peace that is based on justice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Glenis, for, for your contribution. Um, this was a great overview of the situation of um, political prisoners in the Philippines. And I think once again, we can see um, parallels between the different uh, states and how they learn from each other on how to suppress people in their countries. And also, I think it was great that you have uh, brought up all the different alternative ways in which people have resorted to justice seeking and holding <laughs> oppressive authoritarian states uh, to account. So thank you so much, uh, Glenis. Uh, I want to remind people once again that uh, you can ask questions to our speakers and we will be able to um, direct them to them afterwards uh, at the end of our um, speakers. Uh, contributions. So now we have one last um, speaker, and that's Blandine Yukes, who's a member of the International Commission of the People's Congress, a Colombian social and political movement that aims to build popular power from below towards dignified life as part of a movement that um, includes urban, peasant, uh, women's, youth, Black and Indigenous struggles. Uh, she's involved in prisoner solidarity and women's movements. So uh, here we are um, going to hear from uh, Blendin. Hi, first uh, to thank you all. Like this is an amazing opportunity, like and then really uh, to be in that inspiring panel. Uh, we have so many similar situation in our countries. Like I was just uh, listening to the presentation from our friend from the Philippines and in terms of human rights, we could be uh, saying like ma many, many similar issues um, about, about Colombia. Uh, first, I want to I want to say that, uh, like, if we as People's Congress got involved uh, in prison struggles, it's uh, also because our members are being jailed. So, for example, like uh, today is actually the hearing, uh, which is uh, actually a circus uh, because of the pandemic and so forth. It's worse, worse than usual of Julian Hill, uh, one of our, the uh, member of the International Commission of the People's Congress. And also this morning at 1 a.m., like eight of our members uh, were, were detained. So despite the pandemic, like the war on social movement uh, and on alternatives uh, doesn't stop in, in Colombia. So I would go with uh, Colombia in a nutshell for many people who might don't know of a general context. There's an ongoing social, political and armed conflict on the political and armed conflict despite a peace agreement uh, with the former guerrilla of the FARC war and our political party uh, in 2016, like mo like the actual government has been disrespecting the accord, has been tearing it apart, um, has been suspending the dialogue with the other guerrilla of ELN, and like the like the the peace talks have been have been stuck uh, since 2019. In terms of social movements in the past 12 years, let's say since 2008, we've been seeing a wave of mobilizations from indigenous, black communities, peasants rising up until like the end of 2019, in which, uh, as in other countries of Latin America, you would see all the streets uh, full of hundreds of thousands of people globally against neoliberal policies, uh, globally against uh, the policies of that government. 
And if it wasn't because we're in a lockdown and total police state right now because of the pandemic or like the system that created that pandemic, uh, we would be in the midst of a general strike. So this is the general context in which the women's movement has been growing in those, uh, in those years and in which uh, prison struggles uh, are, are uh, in, in rooted, right? So something important about prison struggle is even if the majority of prisoners are men, even if the majority of political prisoners are men, the majority of people involved in support and solidarity are women. Uh, and specifically for in family associations, we can see that 80, 90% of the persons that are involved that support prisoners, men and women, are uh, women from the from the families. So in Colombia, basically the whole um, the whole uh, struggle around prison is based on solidarity and support for political prisoners and for prisoners in general. But in the past year, that's been uh, shifting toward a political debate on prison and on prison uh, abolition. So uh, this is a really interesting discussion, even if I know like many for many people, it's not new at all. In Colombia, it's been growing in terms of seeing how jail reflects the society, a society that's based on uh, equaling punishment and, and justice, right? So when we start to ask who is being imprisoned and what is a crime, this is when we can make the link between prison, patriarchy, and capitalism. And this is when we can understand that jail is actually part of a war, a war on the poor, a war on protest, a war on dissent and uh, critical thinking. So this is why in Colombia we have 124,000 uh, prisoners and this is why we have around a thousand social leaders and land defenders that have been killed just since 2016, the last uh, peace agreement. And if we ask ourselves why people are in jail, usually it's uh, a lot of nonviolent crime and also like for men, it's uh, the main charges are robbery, for women it's narcotraffic and it's not for being a big narcotrafficant, it's just for being people that are poor and that have needs and that uh, and that uh, end up in jail because of uh, you know class issues. So that abolitionist perspective that's been growing is opening a space to think about the kind of society we want to see, to think about the root causes of the crimes, and to rethink the kind of justice system uh, we'd like to see. It's not an easy discussion in the midst of a war because for many victims of the armed conflict, seeing the perpetrators in jail or for feminist movement, seeing the perpetrators of a, fem of a feminicide in jail uh, is still uh, felt and seen as, um, you know, as a, as a way to obtain uh, justice. So this, this switch from seeing like, you know, freedom as an individual issue of uh, individual freedoms with like the classic one of the freedom of, the one of some stops where uh, the freedom of others starts and shifting it toward collective freedom and how do we get rid of class structures, capitalism and patriarchy and build up uh, collective uh, freedom and think about justice not as punishment for breaking the rules, uh, not as a way to discipline the body and shut down the mind, uh, the minds. So in terms of uh, the Colombian justice system, as many of the contexts and countries in which you are, it's not based on the rights of the victims and their right to the truth, reparation, and guarantee of no repetition. And we can see that the prison system and jailing people in general is not getting any kind of guarantees to any of those rights, especially no repetition, because we know the rates of recidivism that that uh, unjust and inhuman system is actually, uh, is actually producing. So a parallel on that is like the women's movement uh, that have been, you know, committed to that building of popular power to like build parallel structure to the state in their own communities, in their own territories. I've been for many, many years asking themselves about alternative justice system, how to deal with uh, rape, aggression and these kind of issues in social movement in your community and so forth. So there was also a long history of uh, alternative justice system, indigenous Communities have their own justice system, black communities have their own, uh, passing communities have been building their own, and this is, you know, like this is something that does exist and that has to be related to that discussion on jail and, and punishment. So um, I'd like to get into uh, what's been happening uh, with uh, prisoners. So that was a bit of like prisons from outside, but now let's see prisons from inside. Um, and I, and I want to acknowledge that actually that presentation was also built with uh, cameras that are in prison right now. 
and with other women that are involved uh, in that uh, process. So who are the political prisoners? I know we have several definitions depending on where we are in the world. Uh, here, the definition we work with is anybody who's been in prisons for political motives, regardless of the charges, classical charges against political prisoners here, as many other places of the world is rebellion, terrorist charges, blockades in the kind in the types of uh, in the in the case of protest. But in any cases, like this is how we define uh, political prisoners. So that involves uh, former, like that involves combatant from insurgency, but also social leaders or activists or land defenders. Uh, that are uh, usually accused of insurgency-related action, but can be accused also under other types of charges. So political prisoners, as a way of resistance to the system that kind of tried to uh, crush them, uh, is actually like they're always have been organized. They used to, all of them in all jails have like their own wings, which was something they had, uh, they had won. Many of them were lost in the past uh, years, but in some jail, there's still uh, full wings of political prisoners uh, that are self-organizing the whole, all the rules inside the wings. But everywhere they have human rights committee, they have their own collectives. So for example, political prisoners of the ELN are gonna have their collectives, prisoners from FARC, because they're still prisoners from FARC despite the peace agreement, have their own collective. Uh, and they have, uh, you know, uh, other, other kind of uh, organizations. What do they do when they're organized? They have study groups, libraries, they do public statement, they write articles, and they enter, like, in relationships with other political prisoners. Uh, for example, uh, they send letter, like, they sent a letter to Abdullah Shalan last year, or they uh, exchange uh, with uh, political prisoners from uh, the United States, or this kind of... Uh, of, of things, you know, so they're organized and they do these kind of things. We also have uh, cooperatives in some cases because political prisoners are not allowed to work in terms of what can be uh, done or not uh, in, in the jail. So they, they, they try to look for ways to sell their products outside or, you know, like do some art craft or many other ways to actually survive uh, in jail. So there's political prisoners and many of them, like if not all of them are involved in what we call like the prison social movement inside the prison. Uh, here it's called the Movimiento Nacional Carcelario, the national prison movement. So it, it aims to bring social and political prisoners together in a social movement, uh, na a national social movement that can make prisoners a social actor. Uh, so then they're part of a social movement, they can participate, they can be present, send audios or videos to like some panels, some events, and be part of the political debate uh, of the country. Uh, they can interact with some university teachers, NGO unions, and they do so. And they organize space so that sometimes uh, they can receive visits from other social movements actors, and sometimes they can bring their voice. So this exchange is really important uh, for us in our, in our, in our movement. Uh, the family and solidarity groups um, have to provide food and goods. Like in many other countries, like the state is not fulfilling what was supposed to be their duty. I mean, they're, like, right now, prisoners don't even have soap to wash their hands. Uh, there's a lot of lack of foods, health situation, and, and, so, and so forth. Uh, in Colombia, as many other countries, like we have an overcrowded population. It's like more than 150% uh, rate of overcrowded uh, jail, so that has a lot of consequences um, in terms of uh, health, in terms of uh, the kind of punishment and torture also that can uh, be victims, uh, political prisoners and, and several other prisoners that are involved in the national prison movement. In the case of women, uh, I would say it's even worse because they're, they're more stigmatized for being women uh, that committed crimes, and especially in the kind of, uh, in the situation of former combatants, uh, the, the women that have been combatant, the guerrilla, have like that uh, double uh, burden, right, of being a woman that uh, decided not to be a mother as everyone and had like violent crime or being a terrorist and so forth. And, and there are uh, very few uh, in, political prisoners and women's prisoners in general. We're talking about uh, 9,000 women on a, a population of 124,000. So their situation is usually uh, invisibilized and they can uh, you know, feel way more um, abandoned by their families because usually uh, like men receive more, uh, more support. 
So let's go in a bit uh, to finish up with the situation of the pandemic. Uh, so the pandemic makes it worse, everything in all uh, in all kind of issues, but uh, in the in the jail situation, uh, it isolated the prisoners, so making them more vulnerable. They have no access to the lawyers or to any kind of NGO or visitors or family that can come uh, get the, the their demands or denunciation and bring them uh, out to the public in terms of access to food and goods, in terms of uh, the conditions they have to face um, in, in terms of, uh, of health and, uh, and, and many others. So what's been happening on March 28th, at the beginning of the lockdown, uh, the national prison movement uh, asked for a prison emergency to be declared. They organized a protest, pot banging protest in all the jails of Colombia. Uh, in the, um, the first one was on March 21st. And uh, uh, it, there was a massacre committed by the guards in the Modelo Bogota prisons. 23 prisoners were shot dead by the guards. So uh, there was a terrible start. Uh, so then protests kept on and on and on going until eventually uh, the actually prison emergency was declared. Um, as any uh, terrible things, it's also brought some opportunities in terms of putting national and public debate on prisons. Like we've never been talking so much in mass media about prisons or in social movement than during the pandemic, because like the pandemic put on the forefront like these kind of uh, issues. But uh, prisoners that have been involved in the protest have been suffering like uh, cruel punishments and torture. For example, the after each protest, like water was took off for several days. They would not have access to food uh, and this kind of, uh, of, of punish, punishment. Despite that, they self-organized and they organized the, their own lockdown to protect themselves from uh, the COVID-19 in the jail. Uh, and they organized with Solidarity Group to fight for masks to be uh, sent in. Many women from the uh, family associations have been uh, sewing masks and, and try to send them to the jail and these kind of, you know, these kind of immediate things, not, a, not out of charity, but out of like, let's self-organize and do what the state is not able to do and should be, and should be uh, doing. They've been trying to punish uh, uh, political prisoners and to make them responsible for the massacre because they've been saying that it was a uh, actually an escape plan and like build up a whole uh, story and so we're trying to um, accuse specifically the political prisoners and specifically the one related uh, to uh, the ELN in order to like you know as we do with social movement in general like bring the debate uh, to to the war situation on April 14th uh, finally the government emitted a decree that is, was supposed to deal with the overcrowded situation. Um, that decree just involved uh, that 4,000 out of uh, 124,000 of prisoners would get out of jail. Same situation than in Turkey, they excluded political prisoners uh, from that list and excluded all kind of uh, crimes. And actually most of the 4,000 uh, people that could access to it because they're not even out yet, uh, are actually people who would have had the right to uh, conditional liberty or to be out of jail uh, since then. So actually they used uh, that decree to reinforce their, uh, their political uh, perspective on, uh, on crime and they have like, you know, nothing's uh, changed. So all the measures the government took are going against everything that the world uh, health organization has been uh, advocating for. It's going against the UN declaration on prisons and on the specifics on political prisoners. And they're not addressing at all the situation of 30,000 prisoners that are actually awaiting trial. So they're still uh, considered uh, presumably innocent uh, for, 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 for the matters. So as, um, so as it, every crisis does, it's also open a huge range of opportunities. So like, for example, this panel is an, is an example of it. Uh, for us, it's really important. And for the comrades in jail, it's really important uh, to know, to get to know the struggles. Uh, for example, people have been following a lot what's been happening in the United States. And I'm really uh, thrilled to have the occasion. I'll try to translate some of the information uh, for, from, from, from your, your struggle there. And this is something that we've been uh, trying to do uh, more and more to make those exchange, to make people 
know about other struggles. It helps us to open imagination to new ways of facing the kind of situation we face. And also uh, it gives us hope about the kind of struggle and the kind of uh, achievement uh, we can get. And as uh, Holian always says, uh, we like her uh, duty as revolutionaries to actually uh, defend uh, joy and hope, which are uh, the fuel of her, uh, of her uh, process. So uh, thank you very much for the space. I would uh, let it here uh, for uh, any questions or before. Thank you so much, Blendin, for this amazing presentation. I think what's really came out uh, during your um, contribution is the uh, tension between the immediate situation and uh, what's happening and demanding justice um, and accountability. And on the other hand, longer term perspectives for, for abolitionist um, transformative uh, perspectives on how life could be governed in a different way led by by people's power um so this has all been uh amazing and um we already have uh, many questions and i will do my best to ensure that each one of you um gets to ask uh, get, gets to answer um the question that has been addressed uh, to them um so of course uh, yara unfortunately can't join us uh, because she's not uh, able to do so at the moment but we have questions that uh, have been asked to everybody, but I will start with the specific questions. Uh, but there's one question that I think you can incorporate into your answers, namely, how would community accountability be designed for cases of sexual abuse or violence against women? Um, what is your conception of rehabilitation? This is an overused term embedded in power structures. And could you tell us how you reframe rehabilitation in your abolitionist perspectives? Um, so that's one question that um, that uh, you guys can can choose if you want to answer. But I'll start with the two questions that have been um, um, directed to uh, uh, to Christina and Nigeria. Um, so since you're two people, we can ask uh, we can ask you two questions. Um, sorry, the the first one is. Um, are there any examples from the 401 community of violent acts resolved with alternative means? Uh, can you please share how that went and uh, given as an example of how things can be done differently? So that's one question. And the second question is, uh, what do you think about crimes against women, rape or femicide and crimes against humanity like um, ISIS, members of state, um, people, um, sorry, people committing genocide and how can we approach their situation in a transformative justice framework? And of course, um, this is a person from the Middle East asking this question. And what do you think about larger uh, kind of crimes and how could they be addressed from, from your perspective and framework? So we'll start with you two. Thank you. Um, I think first we should acknowledge that we are um, speaking from study in our own material condition. So I want to just uplift that I'm sure there are perspectives that we are not yet informed on, especially for those who are living in the Middle East. Um, I think um, when we're talking about how to address any type of crime, um, crime, we have to work on a collective redefining of crime and criminality, right? So what we're describing as crime, um, is it a response to a material condition? Is it an attempt to, um, for, uh, of marginalized folks to be empowered is one question. And when we're thinking about, because you also asked about sexual assault and rape and femicide and um, those types of crimes against humanity, um, these issues have to be addressed within communities. Since we are system abolitionists, our goal eventually is to have an abolition of the state, right? So we are not thinking toward or looking toward far reaching or um, overarching state or centralized responses to crime, right? We are looking to re empower. Um, sectioned communities to address the harm at the site of the harm, right? And so when we're thinking about 
what might that look like? There are so many factors that we have to consider, right? We have to consider what resources are available to the community where the harm has been perpetrated. We have to think about what the culture of the community is there, right? And what type of cultural shifts um, is the community willing to undergo, if any, right? And around what harm is and what crime is and um, what our responses might look like. Um, I can say that within um, our own context, the context of our own material condition, with we must with, with we must heal ourselves. We considered um, accountability circles. We considered <clears throat> therapeutic, psychologically therapeutic, and emotionally healing responses to those who were uh, perpetrating um, sexual harm. And also, we thought about what does creating um, infrastructure within our communities, specifically within intentional living communities that create safeguards um, for people, for women from this type of harm look like? Um, so that is a really amazing and complex question. And I think that there are um, lots of components to that answer. Yes, and we'd also be willing to drop some resources down um, in the chat and on the YouTube live stream um, of examples of collectives doing this right now. Um, I think it's also important to ground us in that the state is not addressing these harms, right? So we are conditioned to believe that the state is the authority and they are, uh, you know, addressing harm, sexual harm, violence. Um, and, and what prompted the We Must Heal Ourselves campaign is that that was not happening. That's not happening across um, in the United States. I can't speak to the material condition in other countries, um, but in the, in the United States, we know that survivors do not trust law enforcement. They do not trust the carceral um, system. And we also know the carceral system um, prevents the healing um, that can happen between the, per the perpetrator of harm and the, the victim. It eliminates that, um, that process altogether because you're taking that individual out of the community. You're removing them um, completely from the community that they should be held accountable to, right? And in some cases, if it's decided by that collective that that individual needs to be removed, then fair, and that's conversation. But that is not um, dictated by the person who has actually been harmed, which is a principle that we feel like um, is valuable in restorative justice. Mm -hmm. I also uh, don't want to be reductionist and. Um, I do think that it is possible that sometimes there are global responses um, to instances of harm. Um, the person who asked this question asked specifically about genocide. Again, in these situations, we do need to center the folks who are most impacted by the harm. And we need strong communities who um, strong autonomous and sovereign communities who will be able to provide the support um, that is needed as outlined by those most impacted by the harm. So when we're thinking like, well, one small community might not be able to respond to the harm caused by genocide. I think that that's valid. And I think that that is where um, building global and international solidarity among these autonomous and sovereign communities that we're trying to build will enable us to address the harm collectively in a way that is in alignment with the values of the community most impacted. Um, as for the question, I think another question about um, how we are conceptualizing rehabilitation. I know that the person who asked the question said that this is an overused term and that and oftentimes when people say rehabilitation, they are projecting values um, onto the individual that are not in alignment with revolutionary principles and we agree. Um, I think for us, the parameters of rehabilitation are defined by individuals and communities impacted by harm, like I was saying earlier, including the person who perpetrated the harm. Um, rehabilitation is a process of transforming human behavior and relation from toxic and harmful to generative and healthy. And I know that that's really broad. And when we have these conversations, people really want to get into the nitty gritty of the, spe the specifics. Um, and that's not possible unless we're willing to apply the question to a specific community, um, because those the responses need to be um, culturally appropriate and uh, uh, in alignment with the resources that are available. 
And I think also lastly, someone asked if we have encountered um, mm -hmm. a violent um, harm in our own collective. We haven't. Mm -hmm. um, we have had other instances of harm where we successfully um, were able to use restorative justice, mediation, mm -hmm. um, healing circles mm -hmm. to navigate that harm. Mm -hmm. But no, we have not had an instance of violence in that Fortunately. way. Fortunately, yes. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Christina and, and Jira, for answering um, those questions. Um, now I have uh, one question for each um, of our other speakers. I'll start with the question for Blandine. Uh, what kind of process might you be undertaking or advocating for to avoid or resist recuperation and to reform? Um, it is something I feel, the person asks, I feel needs much improvement, articulation and commitment here in the UK, as these types of discussions recur in historical cycles across movements, campaigns, electoral divides, etc. Would you like to take that question? I can, but I'm not sure I fully understand it. Uh, in terms of recuperation and, and reforms, you were saying. Um, yes, I think you can focus on that aspect of the question because uh, the rest might be a bit. Uh, okay, big. so so the the way the way we've uh, we've been uh, seeing social change uh, has to do with what uh, Diller was like making that summarize of, of what I was saying of like long term and what we can do now, right? So in that, what we can do now, for example, in the People's Congress, uh, we have uh, sectors that are involved uh, in political parties, that are involved, uh, we have a senator, we have, you know, like, so there's that perspective uh, with with the state, like some people from the People's Congress can be mayors, like locally, but then I, I think like, you know, democratic councilism explain way more and way better. It's that kind of same idea, right? So it's not uh, one or the other one. It's like, if you have a clear horizon of where you're going, everything you can do in your neighborhood, the thing you can do uh, in a protest or the thing you can do in your human relation every day kind of go all together uh, toward that that global objective. So I, I hope uh, I'm, I'm giving a like a short answer to a huge uh, political question and maybe on some of the uh, crimes against uh, against women uh, we've and they do happen with cameras inside of movement movement. And that was a huge step treatment. Uh, to to work toward ways to transform justice to whoever has been a victim of uh, of violence. removal from a task or from a space. But uh, for us, a community is actually the failure. Is actually when you haven't been able to cheers on that, which are uh, indigenous community that they have, which is basically a piece of land in which uh, you can, uh, if you're uh, Blending for giving such a concise answer. Is also uh, the question that were directed at them. The next one is for Aisha. Um, how can we create an, how can we live, uh, prisons? Um, personally, I'm an anarchist and we always talk about abolishing police and prisons, but what are the alternatives? It's, um, uh, alternative, uh, we, we shouldn't, maybe we, we shouldn't call them alternative prisons. Uh, the the prisons uh, they claim uh, to restore justice, right? That's their purpose to to change people. To uh, to uh, the claim is that's not what the, the purpose they serve actually. But the original intention was has been declared as. Uh, justice and changing, transforming people into uh, uh, people who will be uh, of value and good for the society as a whole. So this is, uh, again, I underline that that's not what they are doing, but uh, this is how people were uh, convinced to accept uh, this idea. So uh, in order to uh, make justice possible, in, in order to uh, bring justice, and in order to transform people, I think uh, uh, we have, we, we, we can, uh, it will be good to look at um, 
an ex as an example, not uh, fully fledged and uh, result, but this is an experience, an experiment. We we need to experiment with these things. Uh, it's uh, it's good to look at Rojava and uh, how uh, people's councils and uh, uh, the communities, the assemblies, uh, are uh, deciding on justice. Uh, and uh, how they are uh, deciding on, on the politics of their life, how their life will be shaped uh, among themselves and by themselves. I think this will be a basic, uh, uh, a basic uh, trend that uh, we could uh, say would be happening. Like, for example, in our... Uh, in our organizations, uh, when, uh, for example, when uh, we are talking about a, a, a crime within the political party, for example, if there is a crime uh, uh, that's committed against a woman or involving a woman, it is the women who decide on what is to be done about it, our women's assembly or if there's a disciplinary committee, only the women members of this disciplinary committee get to decide on what is to be done. It's, uh, it's not about uh, prison, but it's about how to uh, achieve justice as uh, one of uh, 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 the other participants described. I think it was Blandine uh, very, uh, very nicely put it, it's, uh, it's about uh, restoring justice, bringing justice. So, and it's about changing people. So uh, we have uh, uh, this uh, idea about uh, this uh, community and the, so so the society uh, taking its fate its, in its own hands and deciding uh, what uh, needs to be done. It, I, uh, I don't know, for example, the one of the pre, uh, other uh, its, uh, questions was about how, how to deal with uh, crimes against women or how to deal with larger crimes like genocide or uh, it could be also individual crimes. It, uh, it's about uh, uh, the society or the community as a whole. Uh, or, involved people getting together and deciding on what to do. For example, when we were, I was, as I, uh, as Dilar said, I was uh, part of the World Tribunal on Iraq. It's a people's tribunal. It's, uh, and uh, while working on it, we worked on that for a long time. It was a long process in many, many countries. Uh, it took its different sessions about the crimes being committed against uh, uh, the people of Iraq and also the, uh, the part of uh, the various um, institutions, international institutions, their inability to cope with the situation and their part uh, in the uh, states and international institutions, press and in many different sessions, many different parts. And, uh, I learned, for example, in that process that in Pakistan, for example, uh, this uh, people who struggle uh, for the river struggles, uh, water and river struggles, they they were they made a long march alongside the main major river in uh, Pakistan, and uh, at every village. There was, they would be sitting down uh, with uh, the peasants of that village and discussing what should be done ag against this international corporation uh, that's creating this problem for us. So, I mean, uh, it's communities sitting down and discussing among themselves, with themselves, putting their rules according to the uh, ethics of the society ag according to what is good for the society, describing the rules and then taking action ag according to this. So uh, I wouldn't say it would be, I don't imagine, I, I think shutting up people is 
is a horrible thing. I don't think it's it's uh, something that would serve anybody any purpose. But it's it's uh, more about changing people, or if they need to be punished, punishing them by uh, putting them away from the society. I mean, closing the society to to them, excluding them. Uh, this would be uh, a much bigger punishment i think like the other white community does it's they exclude you they they say you are not allowed when they hold this communal session in a some sort of a tribunal when there's somebody who has committed a crime against a fellow somebody or as to the against the community they decide they say okay the biggest punishment they give is a, sending you away from the communities, nobody having any relationship with you anymore. I think indigenous people have solutions to that, a lot of them. Thank you very much, Aisha. And I think uh, this is one of the things that we have come out, seen come out in many of the contributions is that uh, looking actually uh, into indigenous communities and local ways of finding ways of accounting, uh, accountability, responsibility, justice seeking, uh, the prison systems of states are not uh, the only alternative that we have. And I want to also stress that uh, in, in Rojava, northern Syria, uh, new forms of um, holding people accountable, new forms of justice seeking are being developed, uh, as well as by the women's movement um, as well. Uh, how can we imagine a society that is not securitized, that is not reliant on authoritarianist um, ways of um, punishing people, but actually how to see one person doing harm to society as the whole society's uh, problem. And I think this really resonates also with the ideas of the Kurdish freedom movement. The last question is for Glenis. Um, how do you think we can build international solidarity between prisoners and prisoner campaigns? And after this, I also uh, would like to give all of you, um, actually we are really <laughs> running over time, but uh, if you could all, after Glennis uh, answers the question, reflect just for two minutes or so on how you think we should move on. How can we organize together? Uh, you, you can, of course, uh, feel free to also criticize uh, this session and also uh, what, do you, what do you think um, we should do as struggles in different parts of the world on um, finding new ways and vocabularies to work with each other. So it would be great if we could also and with some reflections before I then make uh, some shout outs to campaigns and some other announcements. So thank you, uh, uh, Glennis, uh, please. Thank you for um, the question. And um, I think it is very important uh, to link up the various struggles of organizations, um, people's movements, and even um, civil society organizations uh, to, um, to learn from each other even though we have different contexts, we have different um, um, uh, situations, but um, discussing about it and uh, sharing experiences and learning from each other will be a good way to start. In the Philippines, for example, um, the uh, organization of families um, uh, and relatives and friends of political prisoners will um, call Kapatid. They would uh, appreciate um, links uh, with them to uh, not only to expose the situation of political prisoners in the Philippines, but to also uh, join hands in um, uh, advocacy and um, um, even lobbying uh, efforts. And um, we, the Philippines has a rich experience in um, the gains of international solidarity, such as various people's movements supporting the, the release of political prisoners, supporting the International People's Tribunal, which um, shook. The, um, the, the foundations actually of the Duterte government uh, coming from the international uh, side. And it also happened during the time of, uh, of, of another president that um, uh, some uh, political killings, it, it slowed down and even um, charges against activists slowed down because of huge international uh, pressure. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot to maximize for us to uh, uh, join together and see where we can cooperate in all, all aspects of our, our struggles. So that's it uh, for me. 
Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Glenis. Um, so, as I mentioned, I would now like to invite all of you, please, if you can keep it uh, very short, um, we can start in the same order again um, on what do you think uh, we should do as uh, as feminists, as women's struggles, as, you know, as people involved in different struggles for um, either for abolition or for and all the things that you have mentioned, uh, how can we take things forward in terms of uniting our struggles? Maybe um, Christina and Jira want to start. Yes, so this is something that we've really been um, pondering at 401. And um, what we're focusing on right now is trying to uh, develop real, intentional, and tangible relationships with um, collectives that represent marginalized communities all over the world. Um, Praxis, our most recent project, is a front history for Black revolutionaries. It's a traveling school, and we hope that in the um, first year and a half of this project, we'll be able to lay real groundwork in terms of um, building tangible con uh, connection and understanding better what the needs are of our um, family in the fight. Um, we're really interested in um, developing uh, like embassies in the tradition of the Black Panther Party, right? So having formal relationships with one another. I love how earlier Blandine was saying, you know, that there have been um, indigenous communities and um, communities of marginalized folks uh, building parallel structures to the state for some time. And this is how we see uh, the path forward in terms of building real global and international solidarity, right? So how do we build um, parallel structures to the UN and to um, the systems that we know exist to connect our oppressors globally? We should be developing uh, parallel systems and structures and institutions um, to that end and for that goal as well. I also think um, doing a lot of internal work um, to decondition ourselves from white hege hegemonic culture um, that is perfectionism, that leans it away from experimentation as some of the panelists have spoken about. Um, this is a process of experimentation um, and we should lean into that. We should, um, be grateful for that and cherish that about our communities. That is not something to shy away from. Oftentimes when folks ask the question about abolition, um, they think that we have to have all the answers now and that we don't, right? That's part of it. This is a process in which we collectively um, gather data and we collectively establish how we want to deal with each other. And that starts now, that can start now. You can in your collective immediately say, this is how we're gonna deal with each other. We're not going to call the cops. We're going to address harm in this way. We're gonna mediate with each other. Um, that can happen on a micro and a macro level. Thank you both. Um, would uh, Aisha uh, like to continue? I think you're um, muted. Yeah, okay, okay. yes. Uh, also, I had a question directed to me. I, I, it's, uh, I, I don't know how, uh, maybe I'll try to combine them both. Uh, um, it's, um, yes, I think uh, it's very important that uh, these uh, movements and these initiatives uh, get in touch with each other and also build uh, more solid, uh, try to build a, 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 a ways of uh, acting together and learning from each other, but not on a, a, an arbitrary basis, but on a, a something uh, that that's, uh, I, I will say solid, but not in the uh, bad, sense of the world, I, in, not in the uh, positivist sense solid, but I mean, it's tangible uh, is better maybe, in a tangi tangible way. It's, uh, I think we need to uh, uh, learn from the 
communities of, of uh, our countries, I mean, for, for, of our regions, so, uh, the uh, native uh, communities of our uh, regions, and then pass this on to one another to share this information. As, as women, I think we have a much better chance of uh, doing that, uh, making that connection. Uh, it's, it's much uh, easier. And it's, uh, we have two ways. I, I think we have, two, we have to act on two separate levels, combining these, of course. But one is about getting, uh, building something uh, new building what and experimenting with and trying uh, and learning from what's being done, uh, what's being uh, developed and what's being theorized also as being experimented in, uh, as well as being experimented. But also we have to respond uh, to urgent <laughs> life and death matters, I think. We, we have to find ways of uh, uh, responding, reacting collectively to urgent matters which concern uh, life and death, like uh, uh, what's very lastly what's going to happen to these prisoners who are still in prison in times of this pandemic. How is how are we as various uh, peoples, various in women in various uh, organizations in various parts of the world uh, react collectively uh, against this. And it, through our collective action, maybe build solidarities for further uh, actions, for further uh, things that we can do together. But I think this is very important uh, to be able, of course, we should discuss and experiment and we should, this should be on the one hand something we should keep doing all together. And maybe through discussions like this, maybe through other, um, uh, other ways of communicating with each other. But also we need to uh, uh, react to matters like uh, solitary confinement, which is uh, killing our people, which is uh, killing uh, our uh, very uh, valuable people, our valuable comrades in all parts of the world, and uh, take action against uh, campaign and take action against these situations. And the question asked me was about like very, very urgent situation in Kurdistan. Many children are jailed with their mothers in Kurdistan. Babies, we have close to 2,000 babies now in prison with their mothers who are not released because they are political prisoners. And we have children. It's, it's a prison is not a place for children. And uh, so it, this, uh, the children are being deprived of their childhood and being shut up in a prison. And their mothers have to serve the sentence under these conditions. Plus they have to uh, worry about the child. It's it's both torture both ways. So it's uh, I think uh, we have many things uh, to build uh, solidarity and action on the, the situation of children in prisons, the situation of women in prisons. This is not to reform the prisons, but this is to fight uh, to fight against the situation, to react, and to get something in return. This is. Thank you. Um, what I have to say. Thank you, Aisha. Um, Like I think, I think, I think we're doing it, and we have to do it to do it more, right? Uh, in terms of joining each other's campaign, like obvious, like each of those uh, panels or forums or occasions uh, are opportunities to like get to new, know uh, new organizations and new uh, process, and to uh, join uh, the kind of campaigns. I think on political prisoners, we need to be working together. And I think around this panel, we have uh, many of the of the organizations that have to uh, join and be able to work on different level uh, in terms of solidarity, in terms of talking about it, 
and also on the on the age of uh, prison abolition. I think this is a really important moment in history to actually uh, bring bring those those struggle forward. But I also think on a more broader perspective, then even if it's been years since we exist, we you know we've been uh, we've been looking for, like to make exchange with uh, comrades in the Philippines, uh, in in Palestine, uh, in Kurdistan, and 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 in North America too. And we've we've seen all of you as you know like uh, models, inspiring process, and we've always been uh, into uh, building bridges together. But I think what that uh, new stage of the crisis does is that there's no going back to normal, and the crisis is just going to get worse. And this is actually a moment in which uh, there's uh, motivation, time, and energy to actually uh, build stronger br bridges around prison, but more globally around the kind of society, the kind of revolution we want to we want to see. And obviously, we won't have the great international uh, working on uh, full tomorrow, but we have to be building. Uh, those spaces in which we can work together and 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 build up uh, common goals uh, to 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 achieve uh, freedom for all of our uh, movements. Thank you. And lastly, Glenis. I think um, it is all the more important now to uh, closely link up our um, struggles because of the increasing political repression globally and. Um, uh, there are several levels that we can approach this based on our capacities and uh, how uh, uh, we are ready to uh, move forward. But I think at the minimum, we can support each other's advocacies. We can um, uh, share statements in support of those uh, struggles. We can also look at uh, how we can extend material support, um, such as uh, to displaced uh, peoples in our countries, to, uh, to, to those who are uh, most in need. And... Um, we can uh, concretely support international initiatives, um, not only through supporting international tribunals or uh, co-facilitating uh, or co-organizing um, them, but um, we can also support independent investigative missions in uh, countries where um, um, people's organizations request them. And um, I think it's all the more important uh, during this time that we are um, reduced to, most of us are reduced to uh, having online uh, meetings and cannot meet, meet each other face to face, that we have to uh, uh, tighten up our coordination and our linkage with, with each other. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so before we end uh, this amazing event uh, and thank all the speakers individually for their amazing contributions, I just want to say a few last uh, points on following up as well. Uh, we will put uh, some of the links that have been shared on the Zoom chat on, on the different campaigns that have been mentioned. Uh, we will put them onto the YouTube link so people can get in touch with uh, 401 uh, Collective, for example, or like all of, the, all of the different campaigns that we have mentioned. So um, these won't get lost. And I will mention a few other announcements as well. Um, I'll start with um, um, the fact that this is actually part of a larger seminar and panel series that is organized by the Kurdish women's movement. You can find these posters uh, on the on our social media pages on, on, on Twitter of Jenny underline V. Um, this is a series of webinars that is organized uh, by speakers of the Kurdish women's movement on different uh, aspects of the struggle. Um, so this will be happening in the next coming weeks and it's part of the network we Women Weaving the Future. And also there will be an uh, online panel series. Um, for example, this one uh, was the politics of uh, prisons. Uh, in the coming weeks, there will be talks on how, what the coronavirus has shown us, um, what does coronavirus have to do with capitalism and how can the women's revolution be an antidote to that? So watch out for these. Um, also, um, there is currently an ongoing campaign for uh, Zeynep Jalalian. Uh, Zeynep Jalalian is a, a Kurdish revolutionary and um, political prisoner uh, in Iran. So she has been held for several years now by the Iranian regime and she's actually losing her eyesight. 
Um, and of course, there is a lot of sexual violence happening in Iranian prisons as well. And she has been the target of the regime. There have been several campaigns for her, uh, especially because of her medical conditions. Uh, but right now, the whereabouts of Zainab Jalalian are unknown and information is being withdrawn from her family. So we will again put the links up uh, for this campaign as well. This is part of our effort as well, or as part of the Solidarity Keeps Us Alive initiative. And there's also currently, of course, many of us have spoken about the fact that criminalization of social movements are linked to police brutality in prisons. And um, the criminalization of the Kurdish freedom movement is actually very much part of the European state's relationships with uh, the Turkish state. Uh, so we do not see the struggle against uh, the Turkish government's oppressive policies as linked uh, as, as a divorce from what's happening here in Europe. Um, this is uh, Dan Burke, who's currently in prison in the UK, facing politically motivated terrorism charges for his time as an internationalist volunteer with the Kurdish-led uh, People's Protection Unit in northern Syria. Uh, there's no reason for... Um, his charges other than the fact that the British state has a relationship with the Turkish state and he's been held there since November so throughout the pandemic and his bail applications for humanitarian release have been turned down. Uh, his trial will be in October and uh, that will mean he has spent one year in prison without um, without the trial and the Kurdistan Solidarity Network is launching a free Denver campaign to demand his release so you can check out the Kurdistan Solidarity Network's website. So uh, these are just some of the announcements that uh, we wanted to make. And um, just to wrap up, of course, this was just a, a start of a very long conversation that we have to have all together. Uh, please do get in touch with us. Uh, we want to follow up on many of the things that we've discussed. We want to meet in, on different platforms, but we don't just want to talk about our problems. We want to get active. We want to unite our forces organized together because we no longer think that solidarity is enough. We need to have common struggles. And while the prison struggles may look different in the United States, they may have a different manifestation in the context of, of different parts of the world, in, in Asia, in Latin America, and other parts of the world. What we can say is that um, the systems of oppression are, are linked to each other. And while we are looking for answers, we believe that we can only find them if we actually unite our forces, talk to each other, and support each other's struggles. So we recognize that this event is not the solution. This is just the beginning of a conversation. And only if we actively, politically um, come together and unite our forces, we will uh, be able to resist the prison industrial complex, police brutality, criminalization, and all forms of violence and oppression. So I just want to, um, once again, if we can switch to the view of uh, all the participants, uh, maybe we can all unmute our, um, our um, microphones and thank the speakers all together. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>